Hey guys, we want to welcome you out to a continuation of uh, these online seminars that we're doing with Building God's Way. Um, again, I'm Matt Roberts and have the privilege of working with Building God's Way, pastoring a network of local churches. And one of the things that we know is that we live in a world that has changed dramatically over the last six months. And we know that there's no such thing as a church who set out in January uh, with the potential of uh, this crisis in mind. So uh, likely, uh, this doesn't show up in our strategic planning. Um, this doesn't show up in, in really what we dreamt or imagined 2020 would be like. And so we want to give you as many resources as we can just to continue to think through where God is calling you as a church as we move through this year and into 2021 and introduce you to what we believe is uh, just some of the greatest resources out there available to churches as they're, they're wrestling with whatever this new normal is and is going to be in the future. So uh, today, man, I'm just pumped to have Steve uh, Caton join us. And uh, Steve is from Generis. Uh, which we believe at BGW is uh, just a representation of world-class uh, fundraising for churches, helping churches wrestle with generosity. And um, I think that's an issue that all of us are really asking right now, Steve, is um, what is this change? And so for maybe some of our churches out there that are listening, that are thinking about moving into uh, a construction phase, a new building, always what comes along with that is uh, the financial burden that weighs heavily on most pastors, right? And yeah. we know the world has changed. And uh, so, Steve, let me ask you that through Generis, uh, how have you guys uh, responded to this pandemic, responded to 2020? And what advice would you give to churches that are looking uh, towards healthy generosity moving forward? Awesome. Well, Matt, first of all, I just want to say thanks for letting me hang out with you and your team today and just talking about this topic. It's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart, uh, a big part of my own faith journey. And um, so it's just an honor to be able to just uh, have the conversation. So thank you, first of all. Um, I will say that this, uh, this COVID season has been one of, um, like for everybody, it's been constant shifting and bobbing and weaving and being very agile and flexible um, since March. You know, we were we were coming into March with um, just amazing um, traction uh, that we had experienced uh, through the end of 2019 and into early 2020. Churches were just doing amazing things, and we were so blessed to be in the middle of so many projects, uh, just record months, you know, month after month. And so we were just incredibly blessed by that. And then everything came to a screeching halt in March. Um, and I'll tell you, at first, Matt, you know, our, our first reaction was, hey, we need to just take a posture of serving church leaders right now. Um, it, we weren't really concerned about the business so much as we were about, hey, how can we just come alongside church leaders and, and just be a resource and help them? Um, and so because Easter was so imminent when, when the COVID shutdown happened, that was sort of the first thing we did was we really went into this mode of how do we, now that we're going to have to do Easter in a whole new way, what does that look like? And how do we handle the offering moments and all those kinds of things? So, so we basically just kind of went into, into resource mode for a number of weeks. Um, and then, and then I'd say probably six to eight weeks after that, we felt like, okay, it's probably appropriate to start having conversations about how we can come alongside uh, and serve in more of the consulting capacity. And so we started trying to assess what is, what is the best thing that we can do? What's the, most useful thing that we can do and and that's been a constant journey as well because we've really just been trying to understand where church leaders are and as you know matt you've got different situations all over the country based on local uh economic conditions local ge you know just the uh, geopolitical environment that happens in atlanta is different than what happens in salt lake city or colorado springs and so we've had to assess all of that um but and then also just figure out again size of church also tends to make a difference philosophy of church tends to make a difference so i'd say we've just been in this real lear learning mode trying to understand 
uh, how we can best serve while at the same time um, kind of paying attention to something that we think uh, is really important to pay attention to. And that is that, um, that stewardship and generosity um, is such an important piece of how we move our mission forward. Um, and, and it's looking different, right? And so in the generis world, you know, we've been doing uh, capital campaigns for over 30 years. Um, and it's been, it's just, it's just who we are. It's in our DNA. It's what we've been known for. We're really good at it. But we've seen, even before COVID happened, we've seen a little bit of a shift from uh, in the mindset of the church leader to, hey, um, campaigns are great. Get it. I know that there's always going to be a point in time where we may need to do that. That might be the right thing to do for our church. But how can we increase just overall stewardship and generosity in an ongoing fashion, even when we're not doing campaigns? And so we've sort of seen that conversation bubbling up for the last couple of years. And what COVID has done is just hit the gas pedal on that big time. So, so what we're seeing now is this need to, you know, we, there are a few campaigns going on out there. And, and again, we'll always uh, be ready to do campaigns when that's the right thing for a church. But more than anything right now, church leaders are saying, hey, we just need someone to help lean in and help us navigate just the rest of 2020 and what lies in, you know, ahead for us there. But also thinking in terms of creating more systemic strategy and operations around culture of generosity. So that's that's what I think is going to become really a new expression for Generis as we move forward. And I think it's a really good place to be, honestly. So really, you guys are opening up the opportunity to bring in a professional uh, generosity pastor uh, that functions as a part of the team, the staff of a church, without having that large salary attached to it. So really, uh, in a consulting role, someone who becomes a part of a church team moving forward as it pertains to generosity and the initiatives uh, that, that are so needed right now. Yeah, that's, that's well said, Matt. I think that the, one of the key things is that um, I think from a, of a mindset shift, if we think in terms of having stewardship and generosity and the voice of stewardship and generosity within the leadership context all the time, Mm -hmm. that instead of just seeing it as a way that we pay for things when we need to do that, it totally changes the conversation because now if, uh, if you have a, an expert in generosity who's embedded in your leadership team and that conversation is woven into the DNA, the very fabric of your church, now it's going to permeate all the different ways that you do church from teaching and worship to children's ministry to groups to the arts and creative side of everything it, that that's real it needs to be a thread that runs through all of that but when we think in terms of hey uh, we need to raise money for you know building a building or paying off debt or whatever it'll run through those things for a season and then it'll kind of fall beneath the radar for a while until we're ready to do that again, then it'll come up again. What we, what we see is an opportunity to keep that thread running through everything all the time. And like you said, do it by putting kind of a fractional staff member embedded in the church who can just make sure that this happens all the time. I love that. Steve, would you say that that is a service that can work just as well for a smaller church as it does a larger church? Is this something that has benefits on both sides of that equation? I'm sure today we have uh, churches of all different sizes that are listening. Um, how do you feel Generis is posed to, or poised to, to respond to both of those churches? Yeah, you know, and Generis has always been really good at right sizing the work that we do based on the size of the church. Um, and that that's been a value of ours for, for a long time. So, um, so we've, you know, we've worked with all sizes of churches. That being said, you know, typically the church that we work with would fall into that kind of medium and large category. And that's, that's typically driven by budgetary constraints sure. and so forth. So the, the, um, the uniqueness of this, your generosity pastor approach that uh, we're talking about is, yeah, we can, 
we can right size it for size of church, but then you can also right size it based on the, the needs of that church. So what our consultants are really good at doing, um, they've always been good at this, is being able to sit down with the church and understand what are the most critical needs, what is the unique nature of the culture of the church or the DNA of the church and all that. And so we, we've always been good at tailoring what we do to meet that unique expression of that local church that we're working with. In this, in this context, we can now also tailor it to what is their financial capability. And, and the reality is if a church doesn't have as large of a budget, we can still do the work. It just may take longer to do it, right? Because it's all a function of the number of hours that we have to spend and the number of hours a church can afford. So if it's fewer hours, we're just going to focus on the most important thing first, and then we'll just keep working through all the different things that we work through. And hopefully over time, because of the results we're getting, that we can expand that relationship. Yeah, that makes such good sense. Um, what would you say to churches? I think as a pastor of a local church and so many pastors that I've talked to, um, this has been a, a hard shift, I think, for all of us into just the necessities of an online presence. Yeah. Uh, online opportunities to give. Um, you know, I know for our, for our church, we're looking at saying, you know, pre COVID, uh, we probably were receiving 60% of giving online, 40% in house. And to say, man, we need to see that 60% number climb uh, as far as we can. Cause even the idea today of passing an offering basket and having those touch points for safety, like everything has changed. Right. And right. Steve, if there's a church out there uh, that is just saying, man, we're, we're not as caught up as we should be. Um, do you think that's a, a, a good phone call for them to make the generis that can talk them through technology and talk them through platforms and talk them through, uh, you know, all of the different ways in which generosity become, can become more of a virtual movement of the church other than dependent on a Sunday morning worship experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whenever we do an assessment, uh, which is always a part of the work that we do. Front end of any work that we do is always involves uh, a deep assessment of kind of what's going on in that church. And that includes both offline and online expressions of generosity. So we look at, we look at all of those things and, and we say, okay, everything looks good here in terms of what you're doing offline, but there's some real opportunities for growth in the online. Sometimes it's the other way around. So, uh, but we look at all of that. And, uh, and honestly, that's really how we, we, we don't really begin an engagement until we do a full assessment and understand what's going on, uh, what's the culture, what, how, how are we communicating with the body and how's the body responding to that? And what's that look like online and offline? I think one, one of the things I think church leaders can really embrace right now, Matt, in that regard is, uh, for something I heard uh, Larry Osborne say from North Coast Church in uh, California. He did a podcast interview recently with Kerry Newhoff, and he was talking about how, um, it, you know, he was talking, he was comparing Amazon um, to Walmart and uh, to, um, oh, I can't remember, but there were several different retailers he was making a comparison to. But um, what he basically said was, that we've gotten to this point now where the brick and mortar retailers have run, some of them have understood, Walmart being one of them, that, you know what, we don't care whether you engage with us online or offline. We're gonna be agnostic in terms of how you engage with us. We just wanna make sure you have an excellent experience either way. So that was what Larry was saying. That is exactly what the local church leader really is going to have to come to grips with going forward is that no matter how people choose to engage with our church, whether it's online or offline, it needs to be an excellent experience. And we need to not like put one over the other. We need to look at them equally and make sure that that experience is, is excellent on both sides. That's really what the future of the church is going to look like. And we would wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. So would you say maybe a church that feels right now like they are way behind the curve? Um, it, making a phone call to Generis would make a whole lot of sense for them, right? I think sometimes as pastors, our hesitancy to reach out for help is we just feel like, man, we're so far behind. It's a little bit embarrassing where we're at. We, but I mean, that's right where you guys are choosing to stand with churches, right? Is to meet them where they're at with an approach that knows it's not a one size fits all. Yeah, uh, exactly. We want to meet a church right where they're at and help them figure this thing out moving forward. 
Yeah, and I would I say, say it, what's interesting right now, Matt, is that church leaders, I would say mo for the most part, aren't really embarrassed about what's going on right now from a financial yes. standpoint, because most yes. churches are actually doing pretty good. Um, a lot of churches that we talk to, giving has remained steady, in some cases gone up, but their expenses are way down because they don't have those expenses associated with the online or the offline, you know, in-person experience. So they've been right. able to save some money. So I think what's the, I think the real danger right now is even a sense of overconfidence okay. um, in the financial situation because the, there are some things that are lying ahead of us that I think we're, we've yet to experience. So we believe there's going to be economic impact as these PPP loans run out yes. and as unemployment runs out, we're going to, at the local church level, begin to feel the pressure of that, mm -hmm. unlike we have to this point. We really haven't felt it. So, and then on top of that, there's some really unique opportunities uh, for us as church leaders this year through the CARES Act and the whole 100% AGI a giving thing that a lot of church leaders don't know that, that uh, a lot of givers are going to be able to give a lot more this year. Uh, and there's going to be a bigger tax benefit in that. So what, what our team is doing right now, and I'd say this would be, this is how we would engage right now and help is we would just be able to come alongside churches and help them say, okay, how do we navigate the rest of this year and make sure that, you know, we've got everything shored up that we, we, you know, basically shore up what we have. We create some opportunities even for more giving that we may not have, uh, we may not typically see in a, in, in a normal year, and then make sure we take full advantage of the end of year giving because you can, as you know, between all of the nonprofits out there and churches, there's going to be a lot of appeals coming at our givers this year. So how can we make sure that givers fully understand how they can help us advance our mission um, so those are the things that we're helping churches navigate through right now, which looks different than campaigns, right? But it's incredibly important. Yeah. And so is that engagement um, really based on the need of the church? So that could be a three-month engagement, six-month engagement. Is it a contractual engagement, Steve, or just a month-to-month -month, uh, engagement through the church? Well, yeah, we do. We, we've always uh, done contracts for our engagements. Um, and again, in the, the uniqueness of this season, we are we're willing to do things in a much more flexible fashion. And I think that'll be that'll be true going forward for us. Typically, our campaign engagements are a year to two years. Uh, right now, we're we're doing engagements that are as little as three months, um, yeah. and then and then we go month to month after that. Basically, our our attitude, Matt, is that hey, if this isn't working for you, it's not working for us either. We're not going to force you to be in some long term agreement unless it's working. So what we try to do is get enough baseline on the front end so that we have enough time to make something happen and affect some change. And then they can see the needle moving on the stewardship and generosity front. And if they don't, then you know what? We, we're, it's okay. We're, we're, we're good to shake hands and move on. And, and sometimes that's what we have to do. Awesome. I think it's a good thing for, for churches to know that there's a resource there uh, that puts a high value on relationship. Um, yeah. and, um, and that's a, a high value of us here at Building God's Way is to, to meet churches where they're at, where, wherever that may be, and to go on a long long-term journey with them uh, towards God's calling purposes and plans for their church and their life. Um, and to know um, that even when it comes to generosity and money, that sometimes seem to be like an, an, uh, an altogether different conversation in ministry, but to come back to the foundation that it's not, that it's all a part of the same conversation. And uh, there's, there's resources out there for you guys as pastors um, that understand the the signs of the times all around us that, that are doing their best to try to figure out and understand what's next and, and how to properly position your local church and your local community and context to, to be the best that you can be coming out of this. And so um, really, as we wrap up here, Steve, what's um, as, as churches connect with you, um, as they reach out and connect with Generis, um, wh what does that first step look like for you guys? Um, you know, what, what is the next step a pastor can take to engage, uh, to learn more, um, to really go on a fact-finding uh, journey with Generis? 
Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that question, Matt. I, you know, I, I always appreciate the personal introductions that you make. Those are phenomenal. Um, and, and then, but most of the time, pastors just go to our website and they fill out the get started form there. And the way our process works, Matt, whether it's a personal referral that you send to me or if someone coming through the website, the first thing we do is spend a lot of time at the at our Generis home office where we support 48 consultants all over the country is we take a look at the church and we do some initial sort of vetting on the church to figure out, hey, where are they located? Are they part of a denomination? Do they, you know, we look at the different kind of components of the church based on their website. Um, and then we try to make a determination based on what we see to match them with a member of our team that is going to be a good DNA match for them. Because that cultural fit is so important. Um, we don't, you know, and it just, that has to be there first and foremost. We talk about church first all the time. So we try to make a match based on those things that we can see and we make introduce a consultant and the consultant just starts the discovery process. It's always, like you said, it's, it's relational, Matt. So we always start with a conversation. And the first thing we wanna make sure that happens is that there is a good relational match between that consultant and that church. And if, there, if that doesn't happen, then we find someone who will be a good relational match. So that relationship piece is first, and then we dig into the discovery of what God is doing in that church and what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, and how do we come alongside and assist in both of those equations. So, and at the end of the day, Matt, it's really about, um, you know, when you look at culture of generosity and the foundation, you and I have talked about this before, the foundation of a culture of generosity has both a biblical side and a practical side. And on the biblical side, you've got, it's, it's about transformation, right? And discipleship. It's helping people grow in their walk with Christ and be transformed and become generosity disciples, right? And then on the practical side, it's mission advancement, which is about vision and impact. What's our vision? Are we making an impact? Those four things have to be operating in unison with each other. And too often what happens in church world and, you know, you see maybe a little bit too much emphasis on vision and impact and mission advancement. And what that feels like is fundraising. And then if you see too much emphasis on the discipleship transformation part, what you see there oftentimes are some very mature givers who give somewhere besides the local church. They're giving to organizations outside the local church. So we want to bring balance to all those things. And so that's what our consultants are trying to figure out. How do we do that? And how do we do that in unique context of this church and what God's called them to do? Love it. Man, I, I think this is so relevant and so timely. Um, Steve, again, we, we so appreciate uh, the partnership that we have with you guys and um, the ability to work together. And I, I think that's a platform that all of us as companies and individuals stand on as church first, um, that, that we are, are truly organizations and people who love the local church and, and believe uh, wholeheartedly that the local church is the hope of our world that so desperately needs hope today. So, uh, man, thanks for, for making yourself available uh, for all of you pastors, ministry leaders. Um, if you'd like to have further conversation about, about some of these generosity initiatives and how those work function inside your church, um, connect with us here at BGW, uh, reach out to Generis, and um, our, our hope is that we can bring the right team of individuals around you and, and your church to really help understand strategically um, where God is calling you to go and how you get from where you're at today to, to God's calling and vision for you. And uh, so, man, there are some great resources uh, that are just waiting to serve. And so uh, we sure would love to make those connections. We'd love for you to meet these guys. Um, I do want you to know, as, as Steve said, they are a national company. And so no matter where you're at, no matter what your context is, uh, they have done so many projects over the last 20 years. They would love to share that with you and uh, just give you any information you need as um, as you are fact finding and turning on lights moving forward. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you, Matt. And then just, Hey, word of the pastors out there, man, we are, we are uh, praying for you guys. We believe in you and the work you're doing and man, we're in your corner um, so all the time. So just pray that God will continue to bless and give you wisdom that you need for each day in this season. Great.
Steve, thanks so much for your time today, brother. We sure do appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, look forward to see all the great things that God's going to bring out of this chaotic and hectic time. Amen. Thanks, Matt.